Ganz herzliches Willkommen, hallo. Ich werde jetzt im nächsten Satz ins Englische wechseln. Wir arbeiten in dem Fall jetzt beim ersten Mixed Reality Tag zusammen mit dem VR-Plauscher. Das ist eine englischsprachige Veranstaltung. Ich bemühe mich, mein Englisch so verständlich wie möglich zu halten. Ja, so, welcome. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that you all made it here and I'm, I'm really surprised and astonished how many people actually made it here today on a Friday evening um, to our first um, Mixed Reality Day at the University of Applied Sciences Upper Austria here in Hagenberg, um, joined together with the seventh um, event of the Virtual Reality Plauschel, uh, located normally downtown in Linz, uh, which is the um, biggest um, and the well, only Virtual Reality Plauschel uh, in uh, the area. Um, we'll hear a bit more about that um, in a few minutes. So I'm very excited uh, to have you all here. Uh, people traveled uh, a fair bit, so we do not only have guests from Hagenberg and from Linz here, we also have guests from, um, from Vienna and even from Germany, from uh, Eggenfelden, Mr. Krupwinkler, Mayor of Eggenfelden. Very warm welcome to you here um, as well. So, um, we have our speakers also uh, internationally arriving. Um, Tammy Cotil is from uh, Munich. Uh, she came here not only for the event, but also for uh, lecturing. We'll hear a bit more uh, about that uh, in a few minutes. Judith Wiesinger from Magic Leap came from Switzerland over here. Um, so, thank you for traveling these distances to participate in our first Mixed Reality Day um, here at the University of Applied Science. So this event um, uh, was organized by a fair bit of people, and I have to say thanks to uh, many people actually involved in here. So first, I'd like to thank um, Petra Wiesinger <laughs> in the corner, uh, because she did most of the uh, um, management, marketing, um, event um, things here. Um, so thank you very much, um, Petra. Thanks. Thanks go out uh, as well to um, Martina Anzinger and Caroline, Caroline Brandl, also from uh, marketing, who are, do I see them right here now? Okay, so we did a fair bit of uh, uh, social media marketing and um, uh, marketing in that uh, direction. I'd also like to say thanks for the um, support in setup. So I'd like to thank uh, Rosi Mühlener for the physical setup. Um, and I'd like to thank Sascha Bauer, who's taking care um, of the technical setup here. Um, I'd like to thank as well our students um, who are um, not only uh, yeah, watching the event and sitting in the audience, but also giving presentations later on. So we're going to see 25 live projects um, later on uh, here. And thank you for taking also the time and the effort to set up these projects for the presentations. Uh, and last, but absolutely not least, I have to thank you, Heinz, um, for... So, Heinz Dobler, uh, head, head of the software, software engineering department, department um, for, for supporting, supporting this event on the one hand financially, financially but, but what, what is much, much, much more important, important for the whole support in the VR and AR domain uh, here in, in Hagenberg. I really can't say how much I'm, I'm happy about this. Um, thank you very much, Heinz. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll uh, say a few minutes. Oh, um, <laughs> I forgot one person I have to thank as well. Um, because when we come to terms of research, I'd like to thank Gavi again. Uh, so for the great support in research projects here in Hagenberg. And there are many, many more. Um, they will be mentioned throughout the talk. Um, so thanks so much for the great support here. So. <laughs> So let me start a bit uh, talking a bit about um, augmented virtual reality, so mixed reality, the whole domain uh, here in Hagenberg. What are we doing? Um, what is happening here? And we're having several lectures in the area um, of 
um, augmented and virtual reality in Hagenberg. So mixed reality as the umbrella term, as a big topic. Um, there are some examples coming out of the lectures. The lectures are uh, mainly organized by human-centered computing um, since it, it's an HCI uh, discipline. So thank you very much, Werner, for the great support in HCC um, for um, augmented virtual reality and the whole mixed reality domain. So we have two big lectures in there, um, virtual reality and augmented reality, and a, a little bit smaller lecture, uh, mixed reality, with a special focus uh, to the medical area. And the students learn about the theory um, of virtual and augmented reality. Um, so like how do tracking systems work? How do you um, render stereoscopic graphics? How do you perform interaction in these environments? things like that, but they also have to pass these courses by handing in a practical project. And during the exhibition, later on, you'll see some of these practical projects, and um, you are able um, to try them out. So what you see there is mostly games. Well, why games? Because the topic uh, of the project is chosen by the students. And <clears throat> while I was studying, I also had more time for gaming, or I like to uh, play more. Um, but so games are interactive. Uh, it's a good idea to uh, develop games for training, inter uh, for training the development of interactive AR um, and VR applications. So we do not only have these lectures um, in the uh, augmented and virtual reality domain. We also have um, study projects together with companies. And in these study projects, um, we develop in teams of six to uh, ten people, sometimes even uh, larger um, AR and VR projects. And there have been several augmented reality projects in the recent years. I can think of four or five in the two years I've been here, uh, mainly um, by software engineering, also human-centered computing, and uh, knowledge media um, and design. So that's also one possible to get into touch with these topics. Another thing um, where we have AR and VR is in master's and bachelor thesis. So in theoretical um, projects, but also with a practical component, quite often together with companies where we define the research topic, the research question, uh, together with the company. Um, so another way to get in touch with AR and VR in Hagenberg. The, uh, the fourth option is to perform practicals. So we also had practicals at the Technical University in Munich uh, in terms of virtual reality. We had practicals um, together with um, Magic Leap, uh, which we are very happy about that we can do that. And yeah, so um, many, many ways to learn um, developing AR and VR applications. And the third uh, or the next point where AR and VR becomes um, very important uh, are the research projects. So there are several research groups here in Hagenberg um, which are working in the augmented and virtual reality domain, looking at different aspects of it. Um, so uh, we have one uh, group which is focusing um, at software technologies in AR and VR, the ICE group. Um, we have um, a group of the PyLab. We'll also see a fair bit um, of uh, examples from the PyLab later uh, during the exhibition. So uh, Jake is here uh, representing them. Um, where we are focusing on uh, collaboration, multi-user AR and VR applications, and um, also at serious games. So we are doing that since 2016 was the first or the biggest project. You started earlier with AR? 2014, okay. So also uh, quite a bit, um, uh, quite some time in the field and playing with uh, AR and VR in uh, co-located um, collaborative applications and gaming applications. There is also um, a new research group um, I'd like to um, announce um, right now. So I won't go into the details of the project because you can talk with Jake later on uh, with the live demos and he'll give you a much more um, detailed about um, what they've done in the AR and VR domain. So I'd like to announce uh, another group so my colleague uh, Christian Yetter and I, so <laughs> he 
Christian, perfect. So, um, Christian, Jeter and I, um, we decided um, to come up um, with um, our research group focusing on human interaction and virtual environments. Um, Christian has uh, year-long experience in the domain uh, of HCI, human interaction, uh, focusing at multi-device systems, large displays, um, information visualization, data visualization, and my background is um, in virtual reality, um, augmented reality, uh, and in scientific visualization, which basically matches together very well with uh, InfoVis. And um, uh, so we decided uh, to combine um, both of these um, expertises. And we've been working in research here in Hagenberg also for quite some time, so currently um, we have two COIN projects running in the research group um, dealing partially with visualization, or one mainly dealing with visualization, one partially uh, dealing um, with um, VR components uh, in there as well. So we have a new web page launched today actually, so don't expect to find there too much information, but you'll find the contact details. So if you uh, try to look at the interactive site, um, of, um, and the visualization side of uh, AR and VR technologies, um, that would um, be the place to go. We have five people, five full-time equivalents working in there. And so that was the uh, advertisement part <laughs> uh, from my side. So, um, yeah, let's um, uh, get started with uh, our next introduction. I'd like to hand over of a microphone um, to Jakob Leitner from the VR Plauschel, um, and he'll uh, introduce VR Plauschel a bit, and then we'll go on with our talks. Uh, thanks, Christoph. Um, so, uh, my name is Jakob Leitner. I'm one of the co-organizers of uh, VR Plauschel. We have uh, just added uh, Christoph to our team since he has done a really great job. I think it's the, the most impressive Plauschel that we have done today uh, until today. Um, we have started about a year ago. We are around 300 uh, virtual reality, augmented reality enthusiasts. We are meeting roughly every two months. Um, and Please feel free if you have ideas for talks, um, to give presentations, to give demos. Um, we try to be at different locations, at different companies, um, so we're happy to be here in Hagenberg, which is also my uh, university, I started here a couple of years ago. Um, uh, I would like to thank um, Markus Klein from RealWorks. Uh, we are streaming all of our plowshells also uh, for international audiences, and uh, there's a recording. Um, of, the, of the talks uh, available later on. Um, we will do that today for uh, Tamiko's talk, um, but we will pause uh, the streaming for the Meet Magic Leap uh, talk and we'll catch up later on. And yeah, thanks obviously to, to Christoph for doing an awesome job. This is the biggest crowd so far. Um, one last thing. Um, uh, we have two uh, tickets for uh, the DEF ONE conference to give away. Um, if you're interested in that, please uh, go to the uh, Meetup site. Um, we'll uh, give some information about that uh, in the comments. So thanks, um, and I'll head back to Christoph for the intros. Thank you. So thanks, Jakob. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Ms. Tommy Cotil. And I'm extremely happy to have you here. by Christa Sommer, and um, well, it's hard to say how much I really liked that and really enjoyed that. So, a few words um, to your person or uh, to your C. Uh, you get uh, degrees from uh, Stanford, um, bachelor from Stanford, uh, master's from the MIT. Um, you have been uh, working on um, the CM1 and the CM2 on the visual design of a machine, uh, which influenced a fair bit of important people. Uh, but I guess we're going to hear uh, in your talk a bit about that. So I, I, I don't want to spoil too much. And um, yeah, I'm so glad you're here. And well, I can only say welcome. 
Um, the world famous, most amazing Tamiko Teal. <laughs> the stage is yours. <laughs> First, we have to see if the technology works. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Humans are adaptable, thank goodness. I think you just saw me copy something to something else, and God knows where it is. Um, <laughs> but that's all right. You all understand what the problem is. Um, so, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks um, so much, uh, Christoph, for, uh, for... Is there someone who needs to come in? Uh, shall we open up the door? <laughs> um, So thanks so much for uh, uh, Christoph for inviting me for uh, Hagenberg. Um, uh, it was really a, a joint uh, Kunstuni Hagenberg project that we did. Is Christa Sommerer here? She wanted to come at some point, but maybe she can only come later. Um, so it, uh, and we had an amazing a bunch of students uh, where the term self-organizing really lived up to its full potential. Thank you guys, you were amazing. And someone said, uh, I can't ever do this sort of project again because it'll never be as good as it was this time. And I think they were right. But um, uh, so Christoph had asked me to give a little bit of an overview of my projects. And I did start out in engineering. I did Stanford product design, um, emphasis on mechanical engineering design, and then uh, went to uh, work for Hewlett Packard, doing packaging design for computer terminals in those days. Um, and then I went to MIT to do, uh, I thought, a me mechanical engineering degree and got sidetracked halfway through and ended up taking courses that were the precursor parts of the MIT architecture department that after I graduated became the media lab. So, um, so it was the same sort of content, but, uh, but a little bit early. But during that time that I was at MIT, um, I hung out mostly with AI students for whatever reason they had the best parties. The AI students and the architecture students. Those are the two groups that really had the good parties. And I actually didn't know anyone in the mechanical engineering department for whatever reason. But um, when I graduated, really like three days after I graduated, my friend Danny Hillis, who was one of Marvin Minsky's um, doctoral candidates, said, oh, by the way, um, I have just started a company to build my doctoral thesis, this uh, new uh, form of massively parallel supercomputer, and since you have this background doing product design, can you be in charge of doing the design, uh, the, uh, the packaging design, not the architectural design? So that's Danny in the middle, and um, me here, this was actually at my going away party. Um, we were essentially 25, 26 or so, Danny and I are the same age, so um, we had some adults who were uh, trying to run the company. <laughs> Didn't quite work. But, um, but it was really one of these startups with a bunch of 25-year-olds, uh, including, including the chief scientist, Danny. So what came out of that, the first generation machine, the connection machine CM1 and CM2, two versions of the computer in the same package with, with uh, well, basically the, um, uh, the um, CM2 had some... Um, 
uh, more hardware for, for doing scientific computing. And the, it, the company went bankrupt in 1996, uh, basically after the Cold War ended and there wasn't any funding for supercomputers. Uh, Cray uh, also went bankrupt around that time. But in 1989, the CM2 was the fastest supercomputer in the world. If you know the Gordon Bell Prize, it had at least then uh, two grand prizes and two um, honorable mentions, and the CM2 had three out of four, not bad. So uh, it was the first commercially available, massively parallel supercomputer with 64,000 very small one-bit processors. And let's see, it looks like when I designed this talk in the first time, it was 2016. So um, the, the largest computer at that point had 10 million, but that's still a drop in the bucket compared to the 86 billion neurons that are said to be in the human brain. And Danny's, Danny's reason for building this supercomputer was really to try in an era that was where parallel processing meant maybe two or maybe three or four, um, he was trying to really do something that was influenced more by the structure of the human brain. And he, uh, you, um, you might uh, know that um, Murphy's Law, uh, Murphy's Law <laughs> moves on, um, uh, performance moves on, so the CM2 was about uh, an iPhone 5. And I probably should go a lot faster. Can you give me a high sign when I'm like halfway through my time? That would be great. Okay, so, um, so basically there was like a 30 year, AI, there was an AI winter that lasted for uh, 25, 30 years. And when I realized that we were coming up um, in um, 2016 on the 30th anniversary of the launch of the first CM1, I started talking to my old friends, doing interviews with them, and I asked Danny, was it a dead end? And he looked at me and said, well... Um, it turns out that Sergey Brin learned parallel programming, thank you, on a um, CM2 as an undergraduate. And you might know the MapReduce algorithm uh, from Google, which is, uh, together with the PageRank algorithm, was the secret of their success as in their initial capacity as, as a search engine company. It turns out that the MapReduce algorithm is very strongly based on the Danny Hellis's alpha mapping beta reduction techniques, which you can read about in his book, The Connection Machine. That was his thesis book. Um, and then he also said in 2010, Danny had, uh, after the demise of Thinking Machines, started another company doing semantic networks called MetaWeb, and it, that was bought by Google, and his co-founder, John Gianandrea, became head of AI at Google. So was it a dead end? No. But because there wasn't anyone interested in sort of promoting the, uh, the company after its demise, this is really, oh, hi, Krista Samara Lang Mignonot from Kunstuni Linz, the real reason I'm here, and met Chris, uh, Christoph, um, thank you for coming. Uh, so, with that interjection. So, so, um, so this, was, this was, so to speak, history hiding in plain sight that no one knew about, no one talked about, and it only came up when I started talking to Danny and other friends from that time. So that made it, that made it a very interesting topic to, to sort of try and revive consciousness of, of the connection machines, thinking machines, and what they did. And to try and speed up a little bit here, my part on it, um, I had to, when they hired me, they said, we don't even know if it's physically possible to build this machine. So, um, so I had to uh, talk to the hardware designers and try and understand um, what, what uh, we could, uh, how we could actually physically build it. And part of the problem was that uh, the Nobel Prize physicist Richard Feynman said, let's do a 12-dimensional internal Boolean n-cube network in order to hook all of these 64,000 processors together with each other. And I had to wire it. So, I talked to him and said, well, what is this 12D internal network? And he said, oh, that's easy, and started drawing cubes, uh, uh, try, started drawing hypercubes. And then he drew, drew this four-dimensional hypercube, a cube within a cube, and said, basically, after that, it gets very hard to draw on t two dimensions, and it's really hard to visualize. Well, I still had to wire it and not just four dimensions, but 12. So I started playing around with this structure and realized at some point that if I unfold it, 
and put the inner cube and the outer cube next to each other while maintaining the connections, I could do this sort of simplified sort of meta, uh, meta connection uh, level. And then you start seeing this repeating structure. And I realized that basically every three dimensions, it kept on repeating the structure of a cube made out of subcubes. So this was my representation of a 12D cube. And with that, I really knew where every single cable had to go. And then the most important part of any company, of course, is the t-shirt. Because the t-shirt has to um, present your company to the outside world in some very easily explainable ways. So, so Danny and I came up with this design here where the cube, uh, the hard cube of cubes, the geometric cube of cubes, represents the hardware connections that were actually running between processor chips. And the fuzzy balls inside and the fuzzy irregular connections were the data structures, which could be connected to each other independent of the actual hardware underlying that. Our, um, my t-shirt design um, gained renown when um, Richard then wore it in, or in the, the photograph that um, uh, Apple used for their Think Different campaign. And I recently reissued it. You can buy it online. Um, <laughs> but um, there was another aspect of uh, the legacy of the connection machine that came out when I started researching this. And that is that my friend Joanna Hoffman who, when I was working at Hewlett Packard, started working on what became the first Macintosh. And you might have seen one of the Steve Jobs films actually portrays Joanna very strongly. Kate Winslet uh, did the acting and, and actually captured her very, very well. Joanna to told me actually a while ago that when S Jobs was thrown out of Apple, started next, and uh, was starting to build his next computer, he came to her and said, find out who did the connection machine. I want them to design my next cube also. So that was, um, of and she said, well, I'm sorry, but Tomiko's already moved to Germany and gone to art school, and I don't have any uh, contact information. This was before Germany got email, 1985. Um, so, so that was interesting information also, especially to MoMA, who, when I approached them about the idea of exhibiting the, the machine in, uh, for, in 2016, said, oh, I'm so sorry, we don't have any space, but is there one that we can buy? And so I basically dropped everything and uh, went out and found them, one of the few existing machines. And then when they said, oh, it's like, too expensive, I went out and did fundraising, and they bought the machine, and it uh, ran for a number of months in an exhibit that's um, now gone down. But in Seattle, the Wing Luke Museum has one from Paul Allen's Living Computers Museum, so people seem to be uh, um, liking the machine again. I can do a whole hour talk on that, so um, I'm going to leave out all the other juicy bits and go on to other things. I got into virtual reality after, um, you know, after thinking machines, I said, well, th this is kind of fun, spending all my time thinking about what are the cultural implications of supercomputers and AI and electronic brains. And I figured, okay, if I become an artist, I can do that full time. So I came to, I ended up coming to Munich, going to the art school there, and then after that, um, was sort of traveling around the world with my husband trying to figure out what to do next. We landed in 1994 in San Francisco, and this was a point when interactive 3D computer graphics, for the very first time, would run on normal but very expensive PCs. Now, before that, like the year before, you would have had to buy a $100,000 silicon graphics machine, which meant that computer graphics Graphics was confined to an, a very small number of research laboratories around the world. And Ars Electronica was one of the few, uh, few places a bit later that, that was doing a lot of it. But um, I don't know, I didn't have any uh, way of getting in. But I landed in San Francisco and started working for a company that had developed some of this technology that would run uh, in, uh, on PCs and um, was the producer for this uh, piece called Starbright World, working together with Steven Spielberg, who was the head of the Starbright Foundation, to create a virtual world where seriously ill children 
in hospitals across the US could meet in a single virtual world, run around, exchange experiences, um, look out for E.T., who was, of course, Steven Spielberg's avatar, and just play as kids. So that, that really kind of set my initial VR career because these kids, of course, have plenty of tr trouble with nausea from medication. They're hooked up to machines. So from the beginning, the doctor said, no machines hooking up on them. You know, let's just run it on a monitor. And that's really the same technology that became the an interactive 3D games technology and the massive multi-user uh, online games. Same sort of technology, um, but um, you can see how bad the graphics was back then. But I ended up taking this technology and saying, I want to actually use this as an art medium and start making work with it. And worked with uh, Zara Hushman, who was also uh, working at Worlds at the same time. We started using VRML, if anyone knows what that uh, uh, standard was about, to do a piece. In, in this case, there's a whole lot of history here also, but a, a piece basically imprisoning you in the Manzanar internment camp and uh, having you ha uh, walk around the space yourself, completely self-driven ex experience, no little signposts that you can click on, and no forced route through the piece. You had to find your own way. And again, uh, I wanted to present it to groups of people. Is it possible to dim the lights down here in front? Without put yeah, that, that helps a little bit. Um, anyway. It's hard to see, but um, this person here is sitting in a wheelchair, an elderly gentleman. So we wanted people to be able to just use a very simple joystick and steer themselves through the world. And I, and I figured, okay, if people in wheelchairs can use, without hand function can use a joystick, then anybody can. So avoiding really high-tech stuff, um, another reason why I've never gotten into Ars Electronica, <laughs> um, Avoiding high-tech stuff and focusing on the content in a way that you can show it as a large, immersive uh, projection with one computer, one projector, and one white wall, and one simple joystick. Um, lots of uh, um, content here dealing with uh, taking you through uh, an experience of what it is to be imprisoned as a, a quote-unquote Japanese, even if you're born in America and have, don't speak any Japanese and just happen to have the face of the enemy and a parallel experience with Iranian-Americans who in 1979 went through the same sorts of things um, as the Iranian uh, radical students in Tehran were holding Americans captive. So using the features of, of uh, uh, virtual reality back then for taking you through the same space, it's a site-specific work, you always are surrounded by the mountains of Manzanar, but uh, your motions take you sometimes into Paradise Gardens. If you try and walk into the Paradise Garden, you fall out of Paradise, back into prison. You wake up from, from the dream. So trying to get people to understand what it could mean to be imprisoned in this admittedly extremely beautiful location, but what good is that if you're a prisoner and you have no idea when you'll be able to get out? Um, so I've done other, I did other pieces, a lot of very, uh, um, so to speak, heavy cultural content, uh, looking at Buddhism, iconography of uh, Buddhism and Christianity and looking for similarities of differences, dealing with, with the other, and, uh, and somehow politics always creep in. Uh, I had designed uh, some heavens and then I had to design some hells and right then the Abu Ghraib scandal came out of the, uh, of the prisoner who was forced to stand in a sort of a crucifixion pose with a hood over his head and told if he steps down then he'll get electrocuted. So um, these are all worlds where you're basically the dis sorts of decisions you make can get you in trouble or t taking you into a positive space or a negative space. And one of those pieces was actually done in, in 2008 in time for the 20th anniversary of the fall of the wall in 2009. And it turns out that there's now some technology available that allows me to port it 
pretty easily to the Oculus Rift. So we have a beta version out there. I found three bugs this afternoon, and I'm asking for your help in finding more. Um, but um, the basic experience uh, will, will function, and it's out there in uh, one corner of the demo room. So I won't say too much about, about uh, that, uh, but uh, we did do one uh, linear kilometer of the Berlin Wall and the Death Strip and the surrounding uh, neighborhoods in both East and West uh, Berlin. And you have the experience of either being, being a West Berliner, where you can w walk right up to the graffiti painted wall, or an East Berliner, where if you walk up to the wall, then something might happen to you. And I invite you to come and find out what. So um, a big jump forward from 2008 uh, to uh, 2017, um, I was able to uh, do a uh, to work together with uh, Google's uh, Tilt Brush and do an artist in residence there, and did a very s small piece that uses a lot of 3D uh, 3D stereo audio. Each figure has its own mantra, and you stand in the middle of the space, and you hear just this murmuring all around you, and you have to go up and crouch down and put your head in the head of the other person to hear what they're repeating. And the, there's a male voice repeating uh, slogans that Trump repeated in his, uh, in his uh, campaign and, um, the, and a female voice repeating slogans from Hillary. And this piece arose at the point where I was trying to make sense of, of the election in 2016 and trying to understand, you know, um, how come we're listening to these different voices and they're telling us different things. So, um, how am I doing on time? I'll bet I've already used half of it. More? 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 <laughs> okay, we're going to go into fly mode here. Okay, so in working with, with this, there was nothing really out there that um, uh, in 1994 that talked about how, um, how to deal with dramatic structure. Uh, in, in interactive virtual worlds, uh, all the things I could read talked about uh, basically um, what I call narr uh, the narrative viewpoint. And even in first person, it's a narrative viewpoint. And I realized that in interactive work, and especially in virtual reality, where you can run around, you're not first person narrative viewpoint, you're first person experiential viewpoint. And that is a huge, huge difference. The narrative viewpoint has an author that's telling a constructed story, and maybe there's a narrator who's telling the story to the audience. But in the experiential viewpoint, you, are, as the designer, are creating the world that might include characters, certainly includes some sorts of events. And the main character is not somebody that your user watches, the main character is the user, his or herself. And sort of a silent narrator in, in, de, in that they're trying to make sense of all of this, maybe they're telling a story in their head, but the main character is the user, is the audience. And I was looking at things, because I'm not a gamer like Christoph, I was looking for things to understand how we experience drama in our own life without, uh, when we're not doing competitions or some sort of game structure. But there's all sorts of rituals, ceremonies, there's guided tours, there's climbing up a mountain and reaching the top, which is definitely a peak experience. And uh, um, basically, a really condensed version of another hour-long talk is that the focus needs to be on the user. A lot of, a lot of uh, um, classical drama theory and narrative theory talks about how there has to be character development between the characters in the piece and the, user, the, per, the viewers watching that development. But the character development that's important in an interactive VR piece is in the user itself. So you have to take the user, choreograph an experience that takes the user through a series of different emotional states. And um, I, I looked into music, for instance, with the question, how come music which is totally abstract, or mostly abstract, can provoke incredible emotional responses. Think about that difference between a story with, you know, two characters who, like, meet each other and have problems with each other, versus a piece of music. And where do you get the big emotional kick from music? 
And there's this book that was written in 52, but I think is still very much um, relevant. Uh, all the music theorists that I've talked to said it's still the classic, that, that it's actually a very simple thing. It's setting up a structure that produces expectations in the user about what could happen, and then playing with those expectations. Sometimes rewarding it, but mostly surprising, frustrating, twisting things around. And um, if you think, and the classic drama theory and narrative theory likes to talk a lot about things with a uh, beginning, an exposition where you're explaining what's about to happen, rising action, a middle, which is a climax, and falling action in a resolution where you're tidying up the pieces. And actually, Zara Hushman, who worked with me on the Jan Mansonar piece, says, said to me, I want a piece with a beginning and a middle and an end. And I said, well, we're going to be exhibiting it in an art context where people can walk into the room and they can just as quickly walk out. So how do we make that a beginning and an end? And she said, well, what if every time someone else comes to the joystick, it starts anew. Well, if you do that, then I stand here and I watch this person use the joystick, and then I take it over again, and I have to go through the whole same thing again. So, so basically, you can't use this linear structure under the circumstances in which I'm exhibiting it as an installation. Obviously, if you're doing it as a game you, uh, that no one else sees you participating in, you can do a reset. But think of it as having to be a much more episodic thing where, where there's maybe an arc for the whole piece, but you end up having a much more uh, episodic feeling that doesn't maybe have the huge dramatic rush, but takes you through a number of smaller experiences, each with its dramatic cycle. And if you have a music background, I found this interesting uh, graphic online that, that uh, correlates this sort of dramatic structure actually to uh, the form of at least a, a sonata allegro form of an introduction and then you're mixing, uh, you're introducing a theme, you're playing with the theme, uh, creating tensions, uh, resolving them, and the theme at the end is transformed in some way. So um, in 2010, um, after doing three five-year projects, I was... Uh, really interested in doing much shorter projects and got this invitation from a friend in New York to send uh, some 3D content because they were going to do a guerrilla intervention in the Museum of um, Modern Art in New York as part of the psycho Contemporary Psychogeography Festival. So I sent something over I wasn't able to go over there but they organized a little flash mob so people going there and looking at AR on uh, smartphones. I think basically uh, this was about this, the first year that it was really fully um, workable. The year before had sort of started out with sort of baby steps. Um, very nicely, the Museum of Modern Art found out about our guerrilla in, uh, intervention and tweeted it, which of course gave us really good publicity. And, um, and my piece turned out to work uh, uh, pretty well, better than a lot of the other ones. So, um, so it got some nice publicity in the New York Times and some uh, other places. And it was um, this matrix of screaming art critic faces denying, uh, the, denying augmented reality's own validity as an art form. So it, um, again, this is in an art context where the site is very important. The site is a museum uh, that has canonical uh, you know, uh, works of art that defines what the canon is. And so after that, uh, I, I said, well, let's, um, for our next big thing, let's do it in the Venice Biennial. And um, also of all the art festivals in the world, top of, top of the heap. And um, about eight of us participated, uh, and uh, I gave everyone a crash course on the history of Venice and the importance of Venice and the problems it's facing now. And we all did very site-specific uh, interventions that dealt with those, uh, those problems. This was um, um, one of the three pieces I set, all dealing with issues of, uh, of, um, um, of uh, uh, censorship, uh, the um, number of the artists, uh, the um, Emily Jassir and uh, Georg um, Ratz, what's his last name, 
uh, I'm blanking, um, had had pieces sen uh, censored directly in Piazza San Marco. So, uh, so this is, I think the interesting thing about site-specific works is that they're often kind of meaningless if they're not at the right site. So, uh, so I was really exploring this uh, sort of uh, um, relationship between a site. I got a, a small commission to do a work in Munich, um, included a, a video version uh, uh, of the documentation, but it was really about going out into the city and envisioning what could be the future, what was the past, what are the present concerns of the residents. So a lot of discussion at that time about windmills and aren't they ugly and we hate having them, so I, uh, I successfully uh, designed a, a friendly windmill that everyone liked, saying, well, could windmills be part of our renewable energy future? I looked at, the, um, at older maps of Munich and found out that the, uh, that the downtown had earlier been completely riddled with with uh, streams that, of course, we're using to as basically as garbage uh, sewers, and uh, people were getting cholera from them. So they all essentially, by the 60s of the 20th century, had been um, covered over. But in this area here of of, uh, of Lehe, this one small area, I, um, I I put I put these water wheels at every place where those streams crossed the existing streets. Now, a number of, uh, I've seen a number of projects that try and trace water courses that are no longer there. And so they, you know, they try and put, put like, you know, streams. Well, this is using geolocative AR, where if you've ever worked with geolocative AR and GPS, it's really irregular. It's very hard for it to stay in place. So I said, okay, let's go away from the literal interpretation and say there was a stream. Let's put a stream there to doing something that indicated the presence of that water, and if it jumped around a little bit, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't so important. So I had these animated water wheels that were more or less in the locations where the streams would cross, but it wasn't really urgent that they be exactly in the right place. And I think that's really an important thing in dealing with um, AR in the public realm, to, um, to go away from the literalness of, of, of things. Uh, this was also participatory. I asked um, people to, residents in, in the area, to put down their, their feelings about the area, what's their positive feelings, what are their negative feelings, too much, uh, too much traffic, uh, uh, meet, uh, rent prices too high, but positive things like, you know, there's this river running through right next to the, the quarter, so someone said, well, I love doing these Stadtspaziergänge, taking city walks directly in the river. So this is written in their own handwriting, which I digitized and then made gold, because gold shows up against light and dark backgrounds. So that, so to fill the city with with their own comments and reflections. And at some point, I got so tired of trying to take photographs of what is really a beautiful um, little area, but the photograph would, half of it would be a, a car, and then only behind the car would you have the buildings. So I said, I'm gonna put in a bunch of, of sunflowers about two meters high, to hide all the parked cars. So now instead of seeing the parked cars, you start seeing how the city could look if we got rid of the parked cars and, and made it a, uh, a car-free zone. Uh, I think I better start going a lot faster. So just uh, things that might be interesting, um, uh, a bit more technical uh, project fact uh, asked us to work in Liverpool with, um, with scientists who were using uh, biosensors. We ended up using a very simple um, heart rate monitor and, and having people walk through the, sit, uh, the streets of Liverpool and, and they would have to use this, uh, um, the sort of relax to win uh, um, a concept of, of, of gaming where if you, you can't, you don't, if you exert yourself, you don't win. If you don't do anything, of course you don't win. But if you find the right balance, if you can get your heart rate at a level that is perfectly, so to speak, in tune with the city, with the rhythm of the city, then every 10 seconds um, uh, we plant augmented uh, vegetation in your path. And this is a map showing um, how we covered 
the, the city in the course of a couple of days with these huge swaths of vegetation. We got, um, my partner on the project, Will Pappenheimer, got some money from his university, so one of his students wrote an Android app that measured the heart rate, and, uh, and uh, you had to decide, are you an indigenator? So you're planting native plants, or are you an exoticator planting uh, uh, invasive plants that are trying to take over the city? So here's a shot uh, showing native plants by the River Mersey, oaks and, um, and foxgloves. Uh, we did the project also in Basel. Here's the, uh, the exotic plants from America and, uh, and parts of the Amazon. Um, and basically, uh, we wanted to, we wanted to uh, ap approach issues about immigration and movement of, of, of people because of climate change, but um, somehow all of our venues said, oh, let's just focus on the pretty flowers. So, uh, it was interesting you know, because the terminology you use to talk about invasive plants, if you use that same term terminology to talk about humans, you're saying we have to exterminate the in invasives. Um, and it gets very interesting, but somehow no one wanted to go that far with us. So in my next project, I um, became more and more aware in 2015 of what was happening with the climate change and found this very interesting graph that says, okay, if we're up to, um, this is in Fahrenheit, so if we're up to like two degrees by 2050, which we know we probably are going to be, unless all of our politicians change their minds tomorrow, take a look back. When's the last time that the global temperature was at that rate? six million years ago. The human species is only about 200,000 years old. So we're moving into territory that our species has never encountered before. And of course, as a technologically developed species, we're able to deal with a lot of extremes that we couldn't survive without technology, but it's going to get really interesting, especially in your lives. So um, the piece that came out of this it was a commission by the Seattle Art Museum for their beautiful Olympic Sculpture Park, which is on a slope going down to the Puget Sound across the water, these beautiful uh, snow-covered mountains. This is, by the way, my favorite way of holding a, an AR piece. Have this big poster with a big image showing what you will see if you if you download that app and look at the piece, and then have some simple instructions that let people do that. I had people walking by these huge kiosks and going, oh, and whipping out their um, smartphones. Seattle uh, is a very uh, techno fiend place, but um, I think also just the prominence of this was really helpful. So these are various uh, um, flowers that I found, or plants rather, that um, are likely to survive the changes in the climate happening in Seattle. But there's things like the, um, the bullwhip kelp here, they're usually floating, of course, in the water, so their fronds are maybe at the sea level of the water. But um, I have them rotating around, they're like little helicopters, everyone really liked them. But they're floating way above your head. So, this is, a, this is a way of, of sort of playfully engaging your imagination and saying, oh, look at these beautiful plants that are flying around. Now, wait a minute, what are they doing up there? What does that mean when uh, ocean-borne kelp is flying around my head at that level? And then I found this really interesting organism, this red algae. Alexandrium, that it turns out, you know, there's these algal blooms that produce the so-called red tides uh, because, the, uh, because when the waters get warm and there's a lot of nutrients, then these red algae proliferate and they ex excrete these toxins which poison the shellfish and if you eat it, you might die also. And I found that they are on the west coast, they are on the east coast, they're in Hong Kong, they're basically all over the world um, Florida, for instance, has been having, had had a bloom from like October of 2017 until basically the end of last year. So um, this is another thing that I really like about augmented reality. Think of it not as 
It's not an image on your smartphone. A lot of people try and like swipe it. It's not an image. You're, it turns your smartphone into this window that allows you to peer into another dimension. Maybe that's a time dimension. A very common thing is that you'll have, uh, for instance, city tours where they're showing you, you know, old photographs of this location at a different time. But, um, but in this case, you, know, they think you can think of it as a magnifying glass. So these red algae are all around you. And really, in Florida, yes, they were flying around. Um, it, was, it was toxic to walk on the beaches because, because they would be fly the dried uh, red algae would be flying around in the air. And people, especially sensitive to, um, to asthma, were getting serious problems. So this is a way of making something that's invisible, but real, much more present, where you can really sort of look at it and con confront it and, and wrap your head around it in a very different way um, with a little bit of sort of science fiction fantasy in augmented reality. So here's the version at Salem in Massachusetts. And, uh, and then um, this is the last thing. Uh, this is my current exhibit done with my uh, husband who's a a um, um, computer programmer is using the name slash p for our art projects. So we got a commission to do an, a project for the sixth floor terrace of the Whitney, right by the Hudson River, sixth floor terrace, rather far up. And it had to be algorithmically based in some way. So um, what we did was we created a coral reef Corals, you might know, also uh, follow these sort of Lindenmeyer systems uh, growth rules. But if you look carefully, oh, that's a video. I think we don't have time for that. <laughs> that's so I'll switch to the, um, to the image. Basically, if you look carefully at, at our corals, they're all made out of plastic waste, including the uh, iconic rubber ducky, which was uh, one of the first instances where um, scientists realized that these flows of water actually span really the whole continent. So we, again, using GPS, we placed um, all of these very bright corals made of virtual plastic waste on, on, the, on the terrace, and then we're looking at how many people download the app and, and view it, and depending on the number of people who... who Download it, it bleaches slowly, and at the end of a busy day, then you will have a whitewashed coral. So here's a maybe not so subtle reminder that, that your, you know, your smartphone, all of our wonderful devices that I do dearly so love, are also contributing to the sort of degradation of the planet that is really endangering our, our lives, your lives, your children's lives. And um, ho hopefully get people to think about the plastic issue, think about the global warming issue. What does it mean if, the, if Whitney's sixth floor terrace is completely underwater and is filled with garbage? And this is all in a, in a playful, colorful way that gets people to look at the problem I'm not lecturing them, I'm saying, oh, I've got some pretty little corals, come and play. And then they look at it and say, oh my God, what is this stuff? So there's sort of a double whammy that is really, really effective for making people be willing to approach something and then, uh, and then really get a message from it. And this sort of gamification is probably a lot of uh, what's happening with uh, Christoph and, and his students. So I'm really delighted to be able to show some stuff here. This piece is also, uh, for like two hours, we're showing it here because it's really not supposed to be running elsewhere when it's at the Whitney. But just for this little brief thing for this audience, I thought it'd be OK. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamiko. Really great talk. So, um, uh, are there any questions? Not tonight? Okay. So, um, well, so how long um, is it going to be uh, seen at Whitney, the application? 
Yeah, it's, um, it's up at the Whitney until April 14th of, of this year. And I suspect that it will also um, be shown at other places. I've, I've had requests to show it at other places, and I've said no. You know, until that exhibit is over, then I, I really can't show it. But um, I suspect you'll see it around. I hope it'll come to, uh, to Europe. But um, nothing, nothing is planned right now. So, I mean, it is in Europe for two hours now. <laughs> so, thanks again, Tamiko. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. So, I'm very, very happy and excited to introduce our next speaker, Judith Wiesinger from Magic Leap. So, um, um, I got the adapter. Okay, perfect. So, uh, Judith uh, is also, uh, well, in a certain way local here from Hagenberg, and uh, she was doing in the early 2000s uh, software engineering uh, here in Hagenberg. Um, and, oh, uh, yeah, after that, uh, went on uh, to the uh, ETH uh, in Zurich uh, to get her uh, PhD there. Uh, she's also got a Master's of Research from ENS Paris and has worked um, with um, the um, top science question consumption company together. Uh, she has uh, done research for working in hedge funds. Uh, and
You see the apple? Okay. So you see we have a, a fair bit of, of developers and names uh, on there. And um, yeah, everybody 60 seconds and then pass the microphone uh, to the next person. I'll switch the slides in between. And when you, your slide is on, you'll begin, Peter. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Christoph. My name is Peter Haas, and this is Abgus VR. So this is a narrative virtual reality application, which is meant to be placed in a museum, in a very specific museum, to be precise, in the Museum für Abgüsse Klassische Bildwerke in München. So if you want to know the exact topic of that museum, just come to my, um, to my place later on in the VR room. So, well, the application is about a um, research project from a Japanese team of archaeologists um, featuring these three statues you see on the top right, which are made from um, an ancient Greek sculpture called Polycletus. And, well, that's all the teas I'm going to give you. If you want to know what's, uh, what's special about these um, sculptures, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Philip from uh, Human Centered Computing here in Hangberg, and uh, I had to come up for an AR idea uh, for Professor Ante's class. And uh, basically, uh, we had these drawings for a friend of mine who owns a restaurant of his beautiful summer drinks, and I thought it would be cool for the customer and the guest to see the drink before he orders it. And so, yeah, we have a little bit of uh, uh, tangible interaction, and uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay, hello. My name is David Röbel and I have uh, brought with me today an AR chess application. So you all know chess, I guess, but it's chess but in augmented reality. And the thing is you can... Uh, you... How do you... Uh, you can move the pieces, move is the word. Uh, with, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Basically, you can use a wand to do so, and you select the piece and uh, move it over, and then the other guy's turn. Uh, come try it out. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you how it works. Yeah, hello, my name is Christopher Kölner, and yeah, as you see, my, game, my developed game is Augmented Reality Beer Pong, and yeah, I, don't, I, I guess I don't have to explain it quite further because there are a lot of students here. And yeah, like every idea, um, like every project, it starts with a need. And this one night, we had a really big need for it because we didn't have cups to play and we didn't have ping pong balls. So I thought about um, creating an augmented reality game that, um, that you can play, that you can play beer pong on. And yeah, it is possible to play uh, in single player mode or in multi multiplayer mode in the local network. And yeah, you just throw the ball via swipe gestures. And yeah, it's available on Google Play if you want to test it. And if anybody is keen enough to challenge me in my game, we can, <laughs> we can have a look in the activity room. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Fabian Puentecker. I created the application Fear of Height. And as the name already suggests, um, it is an app to fight your fear of fights. Um, or you don't have any fear of fights, just have some fun. And <laughs> it is a uh, Google Cardboard application, so you only need your phone and uh, Google Cardboard. And the main task is to uh, walk on these old wooden planks across the canyon. 
And at the end, there is a small house in the finishing line. And there are also some boxes uh, on the way, and the player must uh, remove them. And yeah, and there's also some other little uh, events happening. But yeah, that's it. If you ever wanted to play with a monster, pet and cuddle it, or make it do tricks, then fetch with a monster is the place to go. <laughs> um, Leopold Orsberg, who sends his apologies for not being present today, uh, and I um, developed this application for HTC Vive, um, which revolves around the interaction with a digital creature called Nigri. But careful, it is a very hostile being, roaming the woods always on the lookout for prey. <laughs> uh, it can only be tamed with flesh and bone. But gladly, we took the time to prepare those for the fearless people who tried to approach it. So, don't fret, come closer. And maybe it won't bite. <laughs> Hi. So we made a virtual one-man band, and that's actually everything I'm going to tell you. Just have a listen. So drop by and give it a try and probably bring some friends so they can dance. That's true, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Stephanie Breyer and I developed the application Guess the Molecule. It's a um, VR application where you are in a, um, inside a classroom and you see a 3D structure of a molecule and you have to guess which molecule it is. You have um, three answers on the chalkboard given and have to give the answer. But be careful with your answer because when you give the wrong answer, the molecule will fall in pieces and all, ele um, all elements at the Atoms and the bonds have to be collected and recycled properly. Thank you. Okay. In our VR experience, let's the water. We take you on an emotional journey. As Lisa, you experience early on in the game or you are confronted early on in the game with the death of your brother. This triggers emotional and psychological um, reactions. Um, you have to explore the vivid and uh, detailed world to find out what happens. And we discussed there some really emotional and difficult topics you don't often find in uh, mainstream gaming. Hello, my name is Jürgen Hagler from the research group Playful Interactive Environments. Uh, this is a project uh, that we have uh, developed uh, two years ago and presented uh, last year on many places. Exactly the first uh, exhibition was uh, uh, in January last year at uh, the um, Kunst uh, um, Historisches Museum in Vienna. It's a collaboration with uh, the Bundesdenkmalamt, uh, staging a virtual Archaeology, this is um, um, uh, staging the data from the um, Roman uh, villa found in 2001 close to Lorc. These are uh, Roman vault paintings and there are four virtual stations where you can explore the data. For example, um, putting uh, the pieces together to bring uh, these 
um, artifacts to life to slip into the role of an archaeologist. This is a co-located mixed reality uh, installation for a museum context where you have the possibility to look into this application. So it's one minute. The uh, mastermind behind is uh, Andrea sitting here in the first row. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Jeremiah, and I'm from the same research group. I'll try to, to save a little bit more time. This project, uh, Logistify, is an educational game in augmented reality. It was a project with the Logisticum in Steyr, and basically you can use cards or you can use uh, a basic map to uh, do supply chains and learn, learn about logistics in general. Uh, a second project that's also with the same type of technology is called Interface to Face with the company Rudy Games and Linz. And basically the idea there is trying to create a multi-user board game experience using uh, augmented reality so that uh, players are not just focusing on their devices, they're also interacting with analog and digital elements. Thanks. My name is Lukas Hammerspichler and I will pr present you my mini racing game. So a user can create his own small racing track with image targets. Each image target has a selection of building blocks which can be switched with a button. Um, after selecting and switching the block, we can arrange them with the image targets and connect them with bridges. And then we can start the car and drive over it. Hello, my name is Lisa Lichtenberger, and my project is called A Mohun Hunt, which is a small remake of a very well-known um, German game from 1999, um, which is Mohun Jagd. So the aim of the game is to um, shoot as many birds as possible, which are flying around randomly, and you have to um, collect points. And I, I added some augmented reality features to um, yeah, support interactivity. So you can, for example, press the virtual button to recharge your bullets. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. everybody has something in his life he or she wants to escape from. It might be a boring lecture or a long day at work or bad date. Or as for the guys in our game, it's like a prison where they have to serve a lifelong sentence. And so Prisoners is basically a mixture of a point-and-click game and a tower defense game. Uh, the goal is to prevent the prisoners from, uh, from reaching the walls. And so each time they reach the wall, you lose a life. And you can prevent them by either tapping them or by using some of your score points to place turrets, which will catch them automatically once they are nearby. And yet the game field itself is created by image targets, which the user aligns on the floor so that the game board is rendered. Um, yeah, uh, I look forward to you having fun catching prisoners at our booth at the exhibition launch. Thank you. Hello, my name is Markus Maureder and I talk about Raptorland VR, a game that uh, me and uh, my colleague uh, Peter Haas and me uh, created in virtual reality. Uh, it is a single player arcade shooter where you have to defend the dwarf planet Coco 2 from approaching asteroids. And if you are unlucky and the asteroids uh, hit the ground, there's a chance that raptors spawn and approach you to eat you, so you have to use different uh, tools to get rid of them. Yeah, hello, I'm Michael Staudinger. Me and my colleague Stefan Auer were, were working on a project for the Red Bull Air Race. Red Bull Air Race is an extreme sport, and extreme sport is extremely cool, but has extremely many rules. And we were facing problems like, how can we show information in augmented, re augmented reality? How can we boost experience using augmented reality? And additionally to implementing this, uh, I was working on having finally a gate to see what the user is experiencing on the HoloLens because it's hard to watch because you don't see anything. Um, 
But yeah, we use ARC as well. Sadly, I have to say that it's today not fully fledged working since, well, please wait while we update your Microsoft product. Um, but still, we have a standalone version and you can test it with multiple mobile phones as well. So come by and check it out. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Lukasz Strzelecki. If you're bored, you can try to pronounce that. Um, my application is Rubik's Cube, which I guess everyone is familiar with Rubik's Cube. Uh, you have a piece of puzzle and you have to solve it. Uh, mine is special, it's in AR. And in order to solve it, you don't actually need a Rubik's Cube. You just need a piece of paper, a specific piece of paper folded into a cube, and a HoloLens device, but that's a minor detail, I guess. Um, so there, you use this piece of cube as a controller. Um, you use your gaze as a cursor, then you give commands by voice and certain actions happen, and all of that um, while listening to nice, chilling music. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Michael Plattner, um, and I tried to bring back, back the childhood memory of playing with a slot car racing toy uh, with uh, the use of augmented reality on the smartphone. Um, here you see um, the tracks, and you have three default tracks to, to play with, or you can build your own track using eight different track elements. And if you uh, drive on the default tracks, I recorded the fast lap and you will see my car driving around and you can try to challenge it. And it's also available on Google Play so you can download it and try it out or come visit me at the VR. Thanks. Hello, my name is Sigrid Huema and my game is about balls in space. Um, <laughs> Um, I developed this game um, as a part of the course Virtual Reality, and it's about the first game part is about collecting the floating balls um, in, a, in the given amount of time, and in the second game part you have the possibility to double those points. So the, the game is perfect for competing against your friends, and yeah, would love to see you later. So our game is called Triality, and uh, in its most simplest form, it's basically a we are escape room. Now I know at least uh, I see at least three people in here who have already uh, made a VR room. So we decided to give it a bit of a twist and an escape room. So we uh, decided to give it a bit of a twist, and instead of having super hard uh, puzzles you have to work through, um, the players themselves are the um, Problem. Uh, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, the players are themselves are the obstacles they have to uh, conquer. So we decided to do something similar with our speech, and I hope it will work right now. No worries. <laughs> So, by the way, all of the people you see standing here are part of our uh, team and work together. It's uh, the joint project between the uh, Kunst und die Linz and uh, FH Hagenberg. So. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, uh, back to our original uh, presentation, <laughs> now that it works, um, I'd ask all of you to say the words on the screen with us, because uh, I know you're such an uh, enthusiastic crowd and I'm sure everybody will participate in this. So can we start? Three. Senses. Independence of. Sensations, one, single, reality, collective, realization, see, hear, touch, texture, sound, light, life, 
experimental. You must pull yourself together. If you would <laughs> have a dream of returning to the virtual world. So if you want to know what that means, you have to visit that back uh, at our booth. <laughs> so. Thanks so much. So I, uh, I think we can start now uh, with the live demos. And we also have some uh, snacks prepared. Um, so thanks again, Heinz, for uh, managing that. And thank you all for the exciting talks, for the exciting presentations. And enjoy the evening, enjoy some demos. See you later.